Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings be upon all of you on this blessed day of Jummah. Bismillah, we begin in the name of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ufiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yadihillahu falamudillala. Wa man yudlilhu falahadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All praise is due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from those of our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray. Whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship, no God except Allah, who is the one and has no partner. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad is Allah's true servant and messenger. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah haqqa tukatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah wa kulu qawlan sadeedah yuslih lakum a'amalakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wa man yuti illaha wa rasoolahu faqad faza fawzan azima O ye who believe be mindful of Allah be mindful of Allah and say that which is right and speak the truth Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins and whoever obeys Allah and the messenger of Allah has truly achieved great triumph Ya ayyuhal nas Ya ayyuhal nas وَاتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ مَقِيبًا O humanity, be mindful of your Creator. Be mindful of your Creator who had created you from a single soul, and from that single soul created its mate. And through both, Allah has spread countless men and women throughout the earth. And be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah in whose name you appeal to one another and honor your ties of kinship. Surely Allah is ever watchful over you. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa sili amri wa ahlul uqtata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana inna ka anta al-ahim al-hakim. I pray that may Allah open my chest, make easy for me this task, and loosen the knots of my tongue that this speech may be understood, and that glory be to you alone, Allah. Glory be to you that we have no knowledge except that which you have bestowed upon us. Verily, it is you who are, who are the all-knowing, the all-wise. So again, to all of you, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. It's such a blessing to be here with you on this Jummah, but it's one that cannot be uh, said to be without so a tone of, uh, a somber tone um, and a uh, a, a, a time that is a very difficult, a time of mourning, a time of grief, and a very heavy time as we cannot ignore the ongoing crisis, the, uh, the, the plight of our sisters and brothers who are in Palestine, in the land of Palestine, in Gaza, in the West Bank, um, specifically during this time in which over 7,000 people Oh, and maybe many more uh, who have not been counted. 7,000 people, men, women, children have been killed. Thousands more who have been injured. Over a million that have been displaced. And we probably have this feeling that many of us here, whether we're here in the States or elsewhere in the world, that we might be feeling this kind of overwhelming sense of not just guilt, but a kind of helplessness that when we see the suffering of our brothers and sisters at such unjust, unjust hands and at such uh a, a, at the at the mercy of 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 such oppressive systems that we we feel like we cannot do much we can't help we can't do anything we feel so constrained you know we see the heart wrenching images the videos the content on social media whether on instagram or tiktok or anything and in the swiping of story after story or post after post um or even after we maybe reshare any of these contents in, in our own feeds, our own stories, we probably still feel like, uh, or we probably still feel don't uh, don't feel any less helpless. Uh, we we feel that you know we wish we could do more. That hey, we just shared this fundraiser, we just contributed to something, we um, saw something, we're doing all this, but yet we feel completely bound. We feel completely uh, in unable to do more, and 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 of course wishing though that we can do more. 
And it's in this liminal space of feeling such helplessness that might differ from person to person. How helpless someone may feel is is not as is, is is relative to our different circumstances. It's not uh, just a um, one you know uniform experience. We may feel helpless in different ways. Um, we may uh, feel especially more helpless when we have family friends that are uh, you know directly connected to those who have uh, ha- have been. Um, you know, being are being killed, you know, uh, just indiscriminately, and 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 being uh, whose whose lives uh, are are being taken without, uh, you know, any kind of you know kind of moment of pause almost, or any kind of uh, semblance of respite. That in in this kind of tenuous time, whether we are you know completely separate and 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 not feeling direct connection in any way of any space or feeling directly connected, you know, we have these different degrees that we feel helpless or inability to help. And uh, especially when we think about that, regardless of our degrees of separation, regardless of if this is uh, happening to a people or to uh, an individual who may be in Palestine and Gaza, and I might be from another country and I might be from another space, our Muslim identity, our identity as people of the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, as community members of the Prophet Sallallahu community, we, we feel this connection deeper than any nationality could engender. We feel this connection deeper than any family connection could engender. We, we feel this connection, as our Prophet Sallallahu had taught, beyond any of these uh, external uh, markers of what we say connects a human being, that why would you feel this kind of connection? And so it's understandable to see the that that uh, pervading sense of helplessness across the board, whether you are um, from one side of the earth or not, or whether you are Palestinian or not, or whoever you may be, may not even be Muslim or not, um, that you feel, uh, you know, this 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 uh, joint sense of uh, this maybe this uh, stymied feeling of um, uh, inability to help, but also this kind of frustration that we feel may feel that we're unsure of what we can even do and in doing so we might also we might may also be diminishing the significance of all that we have at our disposal or that which we are still able to do um, because it may feel to us insignificant it may be uh co- it may come across to us as insignificant or someone else may say that uh to us that well that's not enough you know you're not doing enough and so for us we internalize that we say that oh unless we're doing that huge action or that thing that completely stops, uh, you know, this, uh, the, uh, you know, the 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 ongoing, um, you know, just assault on uh, the people of Gaza. That unless we do something on that scale, we aren't, we 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 can't, we're not doing anything, right? Like it's not, it's not worth it, or we, we just, it's not making a difference. And I, I, it 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 really hits home when we think about in what way the life and the example of our Prophet Sallallahu is prudent for us, especially at a time like this, when we feel so bound, when we feel constrained, when we feel helpless to whatever degree we feel that that those feelings to. And thinking about it in his life, there's a litany of examples in his life that these moments of such helplessness, of frustration, of debilitation, where actions and words of the Prophet Sallallahu show just how much more there actually is to something, no matter how insignificant it might have looked like or felt in the moment, but but also not uh, divorced from the human experience of feeling that uh, you know that that sense of helplessness, of feeling that um, that 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 anxiety, of feeling that pain and that grief, and still having that, yet still being able to see that alongside that experience, being able to actually appreciate and see how much there actually is at our disposal. And when you just think about his life, you'll be hard pressed to find where he's able to simply fix something and not having to endure or to go through it without feeling helpless, resourceless, or uh, in any case, like uh, just feeling isolated. But he's never going through any of these things without a strong connection and foundation of taqwa, of God consciousness, of mindfulness of Allah, as well as tawakkul, of of this trust in Allah, of this reliance on Allah. We open this khutbah as with any other khutbah, invoking that, uh, invoking that sense of mindfulness that 
as the Quran tells us, to, to, uh, to remember Allah, to be mindful of Allah, to uh, be cautious of Allah, be cognizant of Allah, uh, and thinking of what that mindfulness does for us in such moments. What does that mindfulness offer us in a moment of plight where we feel helpless, we feel debilitated, versus if we did not have that taqwa and tawakkul? What would what would that look like? And what does the uh, the taqwa or the tawakkul, that trust in Allah, that cognizance and recognition of Allah, what does that have to offer us, especially at a moment like this and time like this, where twenty days later we are seeing um, what what you know what what anyone um, in 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 the rational thought would see nothing less than ethnic cleansing, would see nothing less than genocidal uh, acts in 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 terms of what's going on in Gaza. Uh, and, and being on a space here where we recognize all the privileges that we may take for advantage, whether we turn on the water faucet or whether we, um, you know, just go outside or go to sleep and not have to worry about, you know, not waking up uh, the next day uh, or that our roof over our head would not collapse, that all these different things um, we, we, we start to see in a different light, especially when we add in the mindfulness of Allah. If we despair in that, if we, if we lose track of that, um, it, it's very easy for us to become bogged down in that helplessness, in that resourcelessness, in that feeling of uh, in, in able to, unable to do anything. But in thinking about the Prophet Sassam's life, when we look at how he went through these different hardships, having those feelings of helplessness at times, having those feelings of isolation, but not without that, uh, that with, without not losing that sense of consciousness of God, mindfulness of God, um, in what way he was able to navigate these things, these challenges, not just time and time again, but able to model it for an entire community at that time and for a community that followed the successors that came after. And so specifically, we look at that element of witness and of dua that the Prophet ﷺ lifted up um, in terms of his actions that ne didn't necessarily mean him moving around and doing all these different things, but the actions that he was able to do uh, with his uh, with his words, um, with his presence, with his witness, um, and with his intentionality. I think about the earliest, one of the earliest examples in, in the ministry, in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, after the message of Islam was being revealed, that we have the example of persecution that has come to the Muslim community. The uh, Muslims that were persecuted at the earliest time in the time of Mecca, when, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ was uh, bringing this message, many of those early people who were being persecuted were people who were already marginalized, people who did not have strong tribal lineages, people who were already on the periphery, who were disadvantaged because of their identity, so on and so forth. And amongst these folks, we have the examples of Bilal, um, we have the examples of Yasir and Sumayya. And specifically with regards to the example of Yasir and Sumayya, um, who were the parents of Amar, um, Amar ibn Yasir, uh, of course, would be you know famous Sahabi uh, who would go on, but uh, Yasser and Sumayya were the would go on to be the first martyrs of Islam, who were uh, martyred during uh, this early period of of Islam during the Meccan time and and persecuted heavily, but were martyred in 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 such a way that we think about the context of these difficulties the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi faced. These these were. You, we understand the the society and the time in which the Prophet Sallallahu came and the context in which he brought that revelation in. He was not a stranger to any of these people in Mecca. He had been living there for 40 years. This is, you know, not a huge bustling town like New York City where, you know, hardly, you know, anybody, much less your neighbor or anything like that. This was a uh, this was a town and a, a a setting in Mecca where everybody knew everybody and not just everybody knew everybody, everybody knew everybody's parents or their lineage and all these different aspects. It's a very uh, intentional kind of connected community, despite its busyness, despite um, all the traffic that it would get in different ways or the pilgrims it would receive. It had its own different connections and many of the people were related. Many of the people were um, across their tribes were uh, connected in so many different ways. And so you have the Prophet Sallallahu coming into a space, not where he's just the only one um, who is the new person in town and he has to get to know everybody that's there. He's coming to a place that's his home, that he grew up in and with people he used to play with as kids and uh, whose children he would watch or, um, you know, just be who he would do business with, who he'd work with. So he knew very well 
each of these people that are there um, beyond that that superficial level that we may be at with respect to our neighbors and the people that we know. And so in the example of Yasser and Sumaya, you have these people who uh, were persecuted, heavily persecuted um, you know, by, uh, I believe, maybe Abu Jahl, their, their over, overseer in that time, the person who um, you know, was kind of see as their, as their, uh, you know, their, their owner or their land or their landowner, whoever it may be, the person who had employed them um, and in whose home they were, they were uh, servants for and, and you know, who they were obligated in that, in that servitude to. And being in that state of persecution, heavy persecution, um, we see the Prophet ﷺ, there's uh, a, 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 a narration of his in which it's detailed in the seerah and the biography that he's seeing these people being persecuted. He's seeing specifically Yasser and Sumaya being persecuted in, in God-awful ways, in terrible ways in which they're um, tortured, in which they're harassed, in which they're beaten, um, really just in inhumane practices. And the Prophet Sallallahu is, is standing there and witnessing, you know, think about what, what is he looking at? What is he seeing? But what is he maybe feeling? He's, he's, he knows these people. He knows the people persecuting them. What might be going through his mind of being there for over 40 years, if not feeling maybe culpable? Did, did I cause this? Did I maybe do something that resulted now in these people being persecuted or in that person becoming a persecutor? Thinking about these thoughts probably were not far-fetched. Uh, in that aspect. But when the Prophet lifts up in this moment, that when he sees Yasser and Sumaya really being persecuted to the utmost limit, to the threshold just before they're martyred, that he lifts up a dua, he stands there in witness and he prays for them. And he says, uh, you know, be patient, uh, family of Yasser, be patient that uh, verily paradise is yours. And he comforts them in that way. But he, he he can't do much. He can't do anything else. He 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 he's not able to go into that space and uh, just you know stop this person from uh, you know you know hurting them or, or uh, about to torture or who's torturing them anything like that. He 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 feels debilitated. He feels helpless. But he doesn't stop. His, he it doesn't make him inactive. He doesn't uh, stop his activity. He doesn't stop what he can do. And instead, he lifts up his hands in prayer and he makes dua for them. And thinking about how the Prophet on time and time again, in a moment where we may see that as, oh, that may feel or look logistically, um, you know, not uh, significant because Yasser and Sumayya were martyred and became the first martyrs of Islam. That the Prophet, you know, this this wasn't he he wasn't able to do anything and he was he was helpless in this moment. So it, it we we trivialize these 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 moments. But when we think about how the Prophet in his exemplar, in his modeling of this, truly reframed those things which felt insignificant and showed their deeper potential, kind of like the tip of an iceberg that we only see a little bit of it. And it may be very grand at that time um, or in its appearance. But when you look below, there's so much more that we have yet to uh, uncover that we are yet to even see that's keeping it afloat and thinking about the littlest actions that might be there, the littlest things that may feel uh, like they are not the biggest actions or anything, but seeing the deeper effect they may have, the deeper dimensions they may even have. What did it mean for the Prophet ﷺ not only to offer that dua for Yasser and Sumaya for them at that moment, what did it mean for the people around him? What did it mean for uh, you know his community? What did it mean for all of these different things? How, how much more to du'a was there other than just saying that du'a feels like it's a slot machine or it's a vending machine where we say something and it happens? The Prophet didn't make a du'a specifically uh, that 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 would uh, that said that uh, was was just maybe limited to that situation. The Prophet made a du'a for them for that which was in the eternal, and then this is important of the people of. Uh, the salaf of the people of this of this time of our prophet and the prophets before that they didn't see this life as all that that it was just this and now we're over it always looked ahead at the eternity because everything that was done was always for uh, that which was with to come and so they never lost hope in that whatever might be happening here never losing hope in what is to come and keeping those prayers as well for that which is to come but as we were saying that the prophet sallam would reframe those things which felt insignificant and showed their deeper potential. 
You have the example of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, when he is coming to a people that largely are not uh, overflowing with wealth, are not here, but you have a commandment in, 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 the, in the deen. You have this constant invocation of giving charity, of giving uh, alms, of, of being charitable people, of being uh, financially helpful to those in need. And it's not coming ignorant of the fact that most of these people don't have money. Most of these people don't have a disposable income or a lot to give. Most of them will, uh, the earnings that they make the day, they will be, have to use them and, and, and continue that cycle. They're not you know, amassing tons of wealth or anything like that. And, and for the most part, you have a elite in the society that probably are, but for the masses that he is, that are coming to his message, that are coming to his fold, um, there are largely people across the spectrum. And in thinking about how did he reframe charity, when you think about the people that said, you have the Uthman ibn Affans of the world, you have the Abdurrahman ibn Aufs of the world who are uh, wealthy beyond any measure and able to give so much charity, able to give so much to the cause of Islam financially. And then you think about this aspect of the feeling that other Sahaba probably had of like, I can't give that much. Like how, you know, the, I, I, how am I going to compete with that? How am I going to compete with that? And how the Prophet Sallallahu reframing of that same sense of helplessness, the same sense of feeling insignificance, turning it on its head and showing them that that charity doesn't just have to be a financial thing, that even smiling is charity. Even removing a, a harmful object from the road is charity. All the, the, to find the charity in the in the world around you, in the spaces around you, outside of the conventional meanings and the conventional thought. Because what is charity? After all, charity is, is this alleviation. Charity is is is, is helping to lift a burden um, and 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 to uh, to to alleviate um, a hardship in that moment. What does it look like to be able to provide a smile? How does a smile alleviate someone's hardship? How does it maybe provide comfort to someone who's maybe having a bad day? How does removing a hardship from or a a, a block from the road something that also is is there to think about? Um, the example of the Prophet I'm lifting up of du'a that how the du'a of the uh, oppressed is one that is that is 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 heard by Allah is not ignored by Allah but the power that du'a has um, to supplicate to to Allah sincerely and and to think about. What that what that has to offer versus just feeling that oh I'm just putting my hands up I'm just saying something no these words these actions they get registered not even if not feeling like it's happening here but in a space and in a life to come they are being registered we have the example of the Prophet Sallallahu thinking about what was it like for him during the year of grief or Amal Huzan the year of sadness in which his wife Khadija had died his uh, his uncle Abu Talib had died. What what was he? What might have he been feeling? You know, what might have he been doing? His his community had been uh, kind of exiled almost, and had kind of been banished to the out, outskirts of Mecca. Had been boycotted from being traded with. So you have uh, a cutting off, essentially very similar to what you see in Gaza, a cutting off of water, of supplies, of food, and all these different essentials for life. What was the Prophet Sallallahu maybe thinking or doing? Well, how how must he have been feeling in this moment? What, he he didn't give up his prayer. He didn't give up his connection to Allah. He didn't lose that. But what must he have been feeling that all these people now, my family members, my tribes folk, are all suffering on on my account or on on because I brought this message or they accepted this message and thinking how he got through those things and how he had, was able to unlock the deeper dimensions of thinking of what does it what does having just that connection to allah what does having that connection to that recognition of that mindfulness of allah what does it have to offer for us in the moments that we feel helpless we see in the example of the prophet sallam, after taif that he comes into the space uh and and is badly beaten is badly uh, you know just kind of uh, embarrassed in in this space and 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 harassed and you know stoned um, violated in so many different ways and you know is sent to the outskirts of this space and running for his life and this is sitting outside of five um, just completely feeling defeated and lifting up a prayer in which he says you know Allah I I, I complain to you of my condition um, and 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 of the situation and the weakness and the helplessness that I feel right now 
Um, and he lifts up importantly, he was like, but if you're not angry with me, um, that if, if, as long as you're not angry with me, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, that, that this, this is, this is relational. This is a deeper connection with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam using his dua, not just in a moment to ask for something, but in a moment to actually connect with his Lord, to be vulnerable with his Lord. So when we think about if our dua has not been enough, that we just, all we can do is dua. Are we just seeing dua as a vending machine type of dua? Are we seeing dua as something that we can be vulnerable? We can ask Allah. We can talk to Allah. We can be open and express our uh, our fullness of our humanity and our weakness in those moments, just like our Prophet ﷺ did, and seeing what does that have to offer in terms of us being able to then be of benefit to our brothers and sisters in Gaza. Um, because if we are not able to be our best selves in, in this space here for them, um, in what way can we offer, uh, you know, being there in, in not our best self? Like, you know, we, we may be doing more harm than good. Thinking about how in, in, in continuing in this aspect of helplessness we see in the Prophet Sallallahu life, when his wife Aisha was slandered, Prophet Sallallahu was deeply hurt, was deeply pained and, 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 and just, you know, was, was unable to truly maybe process what was going on, but was truly hurt by what was, he didn't know what to make of this. And having to wait for revelation that, that came, that, uh, that cleared Aisha of these, of, of this slander, but thinking about, and what, what was he able to do? You know, he, he, he wasn't able to, he did, he, he didn't, you know, feel the need to go and like, Hey, let me go find the people that did this. And, you know, met, met out a vigilante justice. He, he, he internalized it. He, he, he was, he was hurt by it feeling probably helpless. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to believe. I, I have no idea how, how to kind of navigate this. And, you know, maybe, maybe being able to, uh, you know, rely on, 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 on different folks' opinions or whatnot. But at the end of the day, having to trust in Allah that that what was going to come, what was going to be revealed was actually uh, that which would which would help alleviate this time. But it didn't lessen the experience of that helplessness. We see the example of his of the son of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ibrahim, whose, uh, who, whose short life was one that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, had enjoyed as a, as a toddler was and came at the end of his own life, maybe a couple of years before he passed away. And Ibrahim's the joy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's eyes baby that the process of showing uh, his companions taking to the masjid and, you know, people know, but then this baby's health starts to deteriorate and passes away in the arms of the process of taking his last breath. And as the process of holding this baby, you know, he, he makes a famous narration state uh, the hadith that says, you know, yeah, Ibrahim, that oh Ibrahim, the eyes weep, our heart is sad and broken, but our tongue will not say that uh, except which uh, displeases our Lord, that Ibrahim, we are saddened by your loss, but um, we, we, we are crying for it. We are uh, heartbroken about it, but we will not utter that except which displeases our Lord. To think that the Prophet had nothing more but to just offer this supplication at, at such a difficult time, but what benefit did that supplication have for the billions of Muslims that came afterwards who would also deal with the grief? People in his time who would have to deal with the loss of a loved one, how their Prophet had modeled this aspect of grieving, but modeled a, a nobility with respect to how we deal with adversity, that we feel helpless, but we recognize that uh, that helpless is not is not one that takes us into a space in which we uh, we, we recognize or we divorce ourselves from the connection to Allah. Think about the example of Khandaq, uh, the Battle of the Trench. The Quran speaks very similarly as our brothers and sisters in, in Gaza are experiencing feeling surrounded, surrounded in, in, uh, in, in the city of Medina, being surrounded by a confeder uh, confederacy, a confederation of different forces, uh, different tribes and whatnot coming to destroy them. Um, yet it is their patience and endurance. It is their utterance of trusting in Allah that husband Allah wa ni'mal wakil that uh, indeed Allah uh, you know, we, we, we now trust Allah but is the best disposer of affairs, that they, they put their trust in Allah uh, and, 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 and to also continue to reframe in the Quran as we see that to not think of those who have died or those who have been killed in the way of Allah as dead but as living, to reframe how we may feel our helplessness that we, we, we will never see these people again. I, 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 I couldn't help this person and now they're dead and that's the end of their story. No, it tells them that rather they're not dead, but they're living what we don't perceive it. But you, they, they are now in another space where they are enjoying that life. And uh, to think about that, how uh, for those of us who remain behind to seek 
the Quran tells us to seek patience through prayer, that Allah loves those who are patient, but Allah does not uh, waste anything. The law does not let anything go to waste, including the life uh, of those who were innocent, the lives of, of those who were martyred, the lives of those who were taken unjustly. And thinking about that, when we feel such aspect of being stymied, when we feel uh, helpless, that ask yourself, as our Prophet ﷺ had taught, have we really exhausted all of the things that we feel like we can do? Or even the thing that we feel like we can do, do we feel like we've really gotten into it and, and been able to uh, take every single bit of it? Or do we feel like we've only been scratching the surface? If we see what we're able to do, our options as a toolkit, if we see this, that we feel like we can't do more on social media or we can't pray anymore, we, uh, any different than we have, have we stretched ourselves into new frontiers? Have we offered that prayer not just to for a relief for our brothers and sisters in Gaza, have we offered that prayer for our own vulnerabilities? Have we offered that prayer uh, opening ourselves up to that healing and connection? Have we offered that prayer in full cognizance of what all the different dimensions of prayer are? Have we written to our Congress uh, men, Congress women, our legislators? Have we picked up a pen to write to our local papers? Uh, rather than seeing it as something that's fruitless and feeling that we can't do it, have we seen that we can actually go ahead and maybe do something? That have we, uh, you know, shown up in terms of solidarity at different vigils or demonstrations? Have we even educated ourselves on the topic? Are we just, you know, kind of taking what we see on Twitter or taking what we see in, in different social media and that's our education? Have we done the reading ourselves? Have we educated ourselves? Have we started that work at home? Have we even made dua? Um, you know, how much more not only can we do, but that we really can do when we think about, when we sit and think and we be mindful, when we're connected, when we think about what all do we have in the space? We see how the Prophet some would see not just the glass half full, we see the other, the complete aspect of this, of uh, not just when we think about, for example, charity, that's not just a quantifiable, it's not just money, it's not just uh, currency. Charity is expansive to so many ways. And in the same light, how is dua that way? How is prayer that way? How is our action uh, in times of feeling helpless, helplessness that way? Um, and thinking about how much more we can do when we list out really how much can we do? Did we post something on social media? Did we write to our congressman? We've got a lot of thoughts in our head. Did we share those with our local paper? Did we do any of these things? Did we talk to somebody? Did we build relationality? Think about how much more we probably have not done. And it's probably a, a overwhelming amount than we have actually done. We've probably done just like this much here, but what is yet to be done that we can still probably do is, you know, just beyond any quantification. And so thinking about how much more can we go in that sense? And we come from a tradition where the Prophet ﷺ had taught that whoever among you wakes up physically healthy, feeling safe and secure within themselves with food for the day, it's as if they had acquired the whole world. Think about the process and reframe that, that you have the whole world in your hands, that when it's as if you have the blessing of the whole world, when you wake up healthy, when you wake up feeling safe, secure, roof over your head, that your food for the day, it's as if you've got, you don't need anything else. You've got that. And when we come from a tradition that shows that this is all that we need to really feel like we've got it all, that we have so much more that we actually have than we feel like we give ourselves credit for. And so we come to see that not only how much we do have, but we appreciate how much we have. And, and our framing of this feeling of helplessness might change. It might not feel any less frustrating or overwhelming, but we will know that those actions and those intentions will not have been in vain, that they're not purposeless or they're not without hope. And so in the footsteps of our Prophet Sallallahu who for the duration of his life, especially for 23 years as being a prophet and conveying the message of Islam, experienced nothing short of adversity and hardship. And uh, this was somebody who modeled his experience in the fullness of humanity and uh, the fullness of his emotions. But he did it with a connection to Allah, an unwavering connection and trust in Allah um, and a mindfulness of Allah. And in this example, somebody who is who has sh tru tru truly showed us how to make the most of what little we may feel that we have, but also to recognize just how much more there is uh, to, to what we feel like we may not uh, we may only have that we may only have this, but the Prophet saw some asking us to show to look at it from a different lens, to be able to look at it from a different angle and see we actually have all of this. Um, so uh, to not lose sight of the fact that 
everything that we have, everything that we think we have, everything that we also can say that we do or that we intend is not just lost in the space. It's not lost on Allah, that it is registered for us. It is benefiting us, uh, not just in this life, but especially in the life to come. So we pray that may Allah enable us to see the fullness of our intentions and the fullness of our potential and for that which we are capable of to recognize, to allow us to open our eyes, ears, uh, and all of our senses to see how much we actually have versus how much we don't. And to be able to navigate this situation, this crisis at this time, and all hardships like our Prophet Sallallahu did with nobility, with grace, with patience, and with utmost taqwa and mindfulness of Allah and tawakkul and trust in Allah as well as a full humanity that is that is at display and so may Allah first and foremost aid comfort and provide justice to our sisters brothers and uh, our family members Muslim non-Muslim whoever they may be to the people of Palestine to the people in Gaza to the folks in the West Bank and and all across the Holy Land in the in Palestine, that may Allah enable uh, us to not only be those who are uh, their sideline cheerleaders and the people who are there rooting for them on side, but enable us to be their helpers, to be those who help bring comfort, aid, justice to them in any way which is possible in any may. In, in any means that we have uh, at our disposal, may Allah allow us to witness and to be a part of a free Palestine. Rabbana wa taqabbala, Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta samil alim. Our Lord, accept this dua, accept this humble prayer, and our Lord, accept this humble service for us, for Thou art all hearing and all seeing. And may Allah enable us to follow the model of the Prophet ﷺ, not just in the good times, but also in the difficult times, and allowing us to leave this Jum'ah better than we had entered it. And in our final dua, our final prayer is that all praise and all uh, glory is due to Allah, Lord of all the worlds, sustainer of all the worlds. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.